So this is kind of my track through how we achieved it in a purely public cloud environment. So uh, with that, the right scale story, um, we are, uh, again, we're a merchant, right? We had to be that. We are a pure public cloud company. Everything we use, there are cer certain people, um, I'm actually fairly decent friends with uh, both the uh, security guy for the corporate side of Netflix as well as Adrian Cockroft. So you hear a lot of stuff about cloud and Amazon and everything going on. But when you actually start talking to those guys, they actually, at, in the corporate side, they have servers. They have data centers that they put things in. Brightscale does not. We are a pure cloud play, so I have very interesting things that I have to deal with. And, you know, PCI was one of them. You know, we needed to design, implement, and maintain a PCI environment in the public cloud. So my core message to you today is PCI compliance in the public cloud is achievable. How many of you disagree with that statement? Okay, cool. Then why aren't you doing it? <laughs> so, uh, agenda, we're going to talk about the, again, this is my... Pause. Little soft shoe up here, let's see, we'll, we'll go. Um, so a little bit about my background since it's not in the slides. I was a QSA, I came to RightScale almost two years ago. Before that, I worked for a, uh, a consulting company for 12 years. I spent my first six years out of high school on ballistic submarines. Um, I've worked for top secret organizations in the Department of Energy and owned my own consulting business and found out that business is harder to do than most people think it is. So um, I was a QSA for five years. Um, I helped write the virtualization supplement that the PCI uh, Security Council released. That's one of those, I'll admit to it. I also helped write the cloud virtualization supplement, which everybody hates and says is, is kind of worthless. Um, I'm currently on a couple of the SIGs for third party management, which will be, we'll talk to. Because I think in reality, doing public cloud, doing PCI in the public cloud is as much about managing your partners as it is about your ability to do things. So the agenda, application design, and then we'll walk through the PCI DSS. So at the end of this, you ought to be able to say, okay, I know what it takes to do a PCI compliant application in a public cloud environment. And then if you go private cloud or something else, it's even easier. So partners matter. Uh, your choice of two partners are the most important. One is your cloud service provider because in a sense of an infrastructure as a service, they've got the responsibility in a, shared, in a shared responsibility model, they've got everything up to the hypervisor. So it's their physical security that you have to work out, you know, how you figure that out, and your assessor. For some of you, it may be an internal resource, and we'll talk more about this. For others, it might be a QSA, Qualified Security Assessor. If that Qualified Security Assessor does not know cloud technology you're hosed, right? Because they're going to tell you you can't do it and they will give you bad information. Um, and one of the corollaries, we'll talk about a little bit about it later, is that if you use an internal resource that's a, that, that knows cloud, you know, just knows the tech, but has no idea what the requirements of the PCI DSS are, you have the same problem. So you need to find somebody that's that. You now, these people will have a significant impact on your ability to achieve compliance. So your service provider, um, you know, it's a shared responsibility model. I think Amazon coined that phrase years ago. Uh, it has, they have to be doing their part. And we're talking about infrastructure as a service mostly. That's what we use. We use Amazon. But if you decide to implement a PCI environment on a PaaS, right, you decide to use Google App Engine as a mechanism by which you're going to throw it, then they'd be responsible for that. They're not only your infrastructure, but the actual operating system and kind of the, the functionality underneath that. If you decided to use some type of SaaS-based uh, consumer, they would be responsible for pretty much everything. Um, you have a, a SaaS, using a SaaS model is probably the easiest way to be PCI in a, in a public cloud, but most people won't do that because you've got applications that accept, like RightScale, we accept credit cards in our app. So we have to kind of deal with that and it would, using a SaaS provider really wouldn't work in that, in that sense. Here's, this is one of those things, this is from Phil, QSA, having done this, this is 
important, and this is a slide that you should kind of take to heart. Easiest thing to do, find a service provider that's on the list. Go to Visa, go to MasterCard, look at the approved service provider. If they're on there, it's a nice checkbox you got, and you've, you've, you can kind of move on from there. Right? So that's probably the easiest. It is not a requirement to use somebody on that list. I can't stress that strongly enough. There are people out there that go through the rigor of ensuring compliance, but they aren't going to spend the money to actually go through and just get a QSA to sign them off and do that every year. So what you need, right, and that, that's kind of, I actually don't know, hold on one second. Ah, oh, it is. Don't dismiss a potential partner because they're not on the list. What you want is you want somebody that's going to be transparent. Because when you're going through, as we'll walk through the PCI DSS, as you're going through, there are going to be things that you need from your cloud partner. If they're not willing to tell you anything, then you can't use them. You're going to have to know what they do. By using somebody that's on the list, right, they've already exposed that to their qualified security assessor. They've got a report on compliance. It's there, and you can kind of leverage that. Um, the other thing that's important, and this is a requirement of you, requirement 12.8.2, um, is that they, that service provider, whoever you use, needs to sign a contract. It needs to be in the language that says that if they store, process, or transmit cardholder data, then they're going to protect it in, you know, in accordance with the PCI DSS. So it's a contractual thing that you have to have. If you share cardholder data with anybody, and they don't sign one of those, and they get breached, you're the one that's going to get fined, right? You're the one that's going to have the liability for it. So just make sure those, those two things, are they willing to sign the contract, and are they transparent or on the list of qualified service providers? Um, the qualified security assessor will be the authority that signs off on your compliance, right? They're the ones that are going to sign the rock and say, yes, we think you did the right thing, or nope. You're wrong. Um, it, people are getting better. There are a few service providers. I'm not going to say a few. There are more service providers now or, or assessors that understand cloud technology. There are a bunch who do not. If you get them, and you'll know immediately because they'll say, oh, you can't do that. When you talk about multi-tenant environments, they'll say, you can't. It's not true. right? So understanding that you know, somebody that they don't understand your application, right? You're going to have a problem. Um, a lot of charlatans out there, be wise and spend your money. I am more than happy. I won't do it on camera, but I'm more than happy to give you recommendations for QSAs that I would use and that, that have been a part of, of the whole kind of cloud and PCI environment and know what they're talking about. And they're, as far as I'm concerned, I have no problem recommending them. Um, what to look for? Uh, understand cloud technology. And ideally, the technology you're using. If you're an OpenStack, you know, if you decide to use an OpenStack and they don't know OpenStack, there could be issues with that. You're doing some type of private cloud. So the best QSA is you kind of interview them. It's like, we're, you know, we're going to use VMware. We're going to use OpenStack. We're going to use some technology. Find out if they have expertise in that technology. If they're a QSA, you can assume right, that they understand the PCI DSS. That's, that's a decent assumption. Now you're looking for, do they understand your technology? A uh, good default choice, if you don't like the recommendations or you don't ask me, the assessor that did your cloud service providers rock. Obviously, they understand the technology you're using because they did the one for your cloud service provider. Um, if you don't want or need to use an external auditor, then determine if you have the knowledge internally. You know, right scale falls into the second part of that thing. We have not decided to spend the probably... $70,000, $80,000 to get on a list every year to do that. I was a QSA for five years. Um, I, I know the PCI DSS backwards and forwards. So any, I know what customers need from that standpoint, and so we're kind of walking down the transparency. I'll help you walk through the rock process. I'll talk to the QSA. We're doing that. So you may decide, I'm going to use somebody internally. The key to that that internal assessor needs to know the PCI DSS. They may know your tech, but they got to know the standard. Because if they don't know the standard, they're not going to realize that, hey, the firewall rule actually requires ingress and egress, so you cannot use an Amazon security group. 
because the general EC2 Amazon security group is, is ingress only, which doesn't meet the requirements of a PCI DSS. You have to use host-based firewalls. It's, it's those type of things that, that you have to know the difference between the two. So it's important to have that, that proper resource. So, and uh, you know, as a reminder, it is achievable. PCI in the public cloud is achievable, and you know, we can do that. The next most important thing after picking a good provider and the right assessor is your application design. This should be no, should be no surprise to anybody. You know, your, ability to, your ability to achieve PCI compliance in the public cloud has more to do with your application design than, you know, than the assessor or than the cloud service provider that you use. Um, really, for the most part, most providers and cloud-based operating systems can be PCI compliant. You, know, you can look at it, they, they can meet those requirements, right? You can get that done. Most applications I've looked at, the, the same cannot be said. You look at the applications and are they, you know, are they written? How do you operate? How do you do things? So what you should do is ask the following questions. What data am I storing and can I get away without it? Number one rule in, you know, number one rule of fight clubs, don't talk about fight. Number one rule of PCI, don't store it if you don't need it. Right? Don't take it if you don't need it. So look at it. Do I need it? And maybe is not the right answer. Right? It's yes or no. And if you don't need it, don't store it. It makes life easier. Uh, do you know the communication flow of the application, and can you restrict it? And a lot of people don't understand, hey, well, how's my communication? What are the ports? What are the protocols that are needed? How do I do that? Knowing that's important. And you know, am I using well-known public vetted crypto? As a QSA, as a former consultant for 12 years, if I walked into somebody, I don't care what it was, and say, how are you doing that? Oh, our crypto expert designed, you know, we are, it's a proprietary algorithm. Right? It's like, that, fail, right there. There's just no way. AES, you know, triple DES, use publicly vetted crypto for what you do. Don't try and reinvent the wheel. You know, if you're running on a win, uh, you know, Windows box, use their crypto library. You know, Java... All the crypto libraries that are available using standards like AES, that's the way to go. Nothing public. So those three things for your application, you ought to be pretty good. Um, some guidelines right, to make sure it's securable. Don't store the primary account number if you don't need to. So if you don't store the PAN, almost all of the PCI DSS does not apply to you. It's easy. If you don't store the PAN, life is simple. Guess what? Right scale does not store the pan. My life is easy. If you store the pan, it becomes a little bit more difficult. Uh, many payment processors, a lot of people in my, my history of being a QSA, a lot of people would say, oh, I need it for recurring billing. Not the case. Payment processors will give you reference numbers, things like that, that you can use for recurring billing. So again, back to, do I need the data or not? Think about it, make sure. If you're going to store the pan, then design a crypto mechanism, more importantly, the key management, Crypto is simple, right? It's easy to encrypt anything. How do you manage the keys? What happens when that key gets compromised? How do you rotate it? All of those things. The key management is the, it's the bugger in this whole thing, right? So think about the key management, you know, of the database. How do you do this? You know, again, this is really not a cloud thing. This is whether you're doing a you know, hosted environment or running it on-prem your, on your own servers. It's still the same issue. So. Think about it. Do I need the pan? If I have to have it, how am I encrypting it? And am I doing proper key management? Those are two of the things that I've found over the years that really end up biting people. Uh, number three, terminate. And this is, should be, you know, this should be, oh yeah, no problem. It's amazing the number of uh, actual websites I've seen that have PCI information that you can access over port 80. It's like, really? You're kidding me, right? No, I'm not. So terminate uh, SSL and TLS at the load balancer. So this is a, another kind of, maybe this is a little bit Amazon specific, but it's a, it's a great use case, I, I think. The 10 net in Amazon is considered a private network from a PCI DSS standpoint. You can terminate at the load balancer, run everything, all internal communications over the 10 net, and you meet the PCI DSS. That doesn't mean that you shouldn't you'll run SSL or some other, you know, some other transport layer encryption 
between all your components, that's fine, but understand from meeting the PCI DSS, you do not have to. You can terminate it at the load balancer and use the private network um, as, a, as a private network, which does not require encryption. And then fourth, for the, you know, for the application, the most validate user input, right? Because you're gonna have to go through testing parts of it and it's going to be, you've got cross-site scripting, you've got SQL injection, all of those things end up getting back to user input. Did you validate input? Oh, it was supposed to be a PAN. PAN does not have the letters S-C-R-I-P-T, right? There's no such thing as, you know, bracket script bracket in a PAN. So validate it, you know, whitelist it if you can. And yeah, in, in reality, that's pretty much it. Protect it and in transit at rest if needed and test for bad code. That right there is how you make your application PCI compliant. Now, obviously, there's a lot. If it was that simple, everybody would be doing it right. So there's a lot. It's not rocket science, but the reality is most folks don't get it right. The other thing, too, just as a, just as a caveat, for authentication, right, if people are logging, not, not people maybe using the application, but administrative type things, think about using two-factor authentication. Um, it's kind of near and dear to my heart. I do a little bit of investing on the side. I mean, we probably all have things in, and I'm sure... Most people probably heard about the Twitter issue that happened on Wednesday. It caused the market to you know, drop. It was a, it was a 300,000. I was looking at the uh, S&P futures. It was a 300,000 share basically drop pop in five minutes because of the tweet that went out about the White House being bombed and Obama being hurt because somebody got fished and within an hour their Twitter account got hacked. It was the AP Twitter account and boom. So... Think about how do I authenticate people to the applications that I use. Um, so real important. Again, most of this we look at it and say, yeah, we know this. But a lot of people just don't do it. Any questions up to this point? All right. Uh, hardening the systems. And this is one of the, I'm not sure. Eh, it's probably, it looks like a few, few people out there, maybe my age, that remember this. There used to be a commercial that I watched as a kid. It was for... Uh, it was for, for Calgon. It was a uh, dishwasher, uh, not a dishwasher, but a washing detergent. And the guy comes into the dry cleaner and says, how do you get my shirt so white? And uh, the lady, she was a, a, an Asian lady. She said, oh, ancient Chinese secret. Right? And then they pan to the back, and you see this guy with the washing machine open. He's dumping a, some Calgon, you know, Calgon into the dishwasher. And it, it was... It's like there is, no, there is no secret, right? These things are standard hardening guides, those type of things. It's just something we should be doing. It's general security hygiene. Um, so what do you do? Uh, protect the system, firewall. Key point, remember both the firewall has to be ingress and egress. Lots of people in the, in the you know, environment, you can do things with some VPC, some uh, virtual private clouds. Those are a little different, but for the most part, in public cloud environments like an EC2 General or even Google Compute Engine, you know, Azure, things like that, it's going to be host-based firewalls that you'll end up using. Uh, change the defaults, right? Install patches, imagine that. Uh, watch system fraud behavior. Uh, one shout out, Cloud Passage, it happens to be a partner that we have. It's a partner that I use for my cloud environment, I mean, uh, my PCI environment, because they provide, they provide some visibility that, that that I like. Um, they're a good company. They run on all, you know, a bunch of different clouds. So I just shout out to them because they've made my compliance easier. I think it is, a lot of it, instead of, you can roll a lot of this yourself, but finding good partners makes life easier. I think it was kind of like uh, the, the gentleman from Samsung that just got done talking, where he was talking, use the right people, find people to help you out. Big deal. Um, I were, Obviously, right, shameless plug, right, I recommend using a public cloud management, you know, solution to try to do this stuff, because how do you do it when things come up and down? That's one of the benefits. We use RightScale to manage RightScale as well as manage our PCI environment, so I know when a system comes up, I know what it looks like. Why? Because my server template that's used to build it, I can look at. I know that it comes up the same way every time. I change the server template, I don't have to worry, hey, was that gold image? Did we get the right one? No. Boom. It's up. So... Harden the systems, and I'm tired of that. So let's look at the PCI kind of real quick. That's, that's, that's really the, the gist of it, right? Write the application, get a good assessor, 
use the right cloud provider, and it's, it's, it's pretty easy to do. So when we think about PCI in the cloud, when we look at this, these are, they're not really orange. They're kind of salmon color. The salmon colors are the ones that really matter in cloud. That, that's different than your hosted environment or even if you have something on-prem. And these are the 12, and we'll actually go through them. So requirement one for firewalls. Uh, you know, design the application flow so they can be secured. Don't have everything, you, you don't want to have, I don't know what ports are used, so I have to open everything up. Not acceptable, right? Design the application so you know what communications need to be there. Uh, the state of networking features are going to, they're going to play a part. You need to think about, you know, ingress, egress, probably the biggest part. You know, what happens, what's the difference between a virtual private cloud, how is Azure different than Google Compute Engine? Again, whatever soft layer, data pipe, whatever you happen to choose as, uh, you know, as a cloud provider. And then review and audit regularly to make sure the design and implementations haven't changed. A lot of times, people just, they, they kind of set stuff. It's like, okay, it's good, and we move on. The part of the PCI DSS in, in requirement 12, which is about governance, talks about reviewing things, making sure that you're using them right. Um, audit, reviews, approvals, those type of things. Um, nice aspect to cloud is since automation is a part of the DNA, it's much easier. For us, again, a lot of my reviews, I just go review a server template. Look at a server template, I see that, I see what security groups are a part of it, boom, I'm done. Why? Because I know the next time that thing's launched, it's good to go. Requirement two is defaults, right? Change vendor defaults. Everybody, oh, this, you know, this is a, somebody did a network map uh, of, they were actually looking for SCADA systems, uh, embedded systems for control devices, did a network map of the entire internet. And they found like, I think it was 5 million devices with like admin admin on the default web interface for the management of these, you know, these devices. A lot of them are home Linksys routers, things like that. But, but then what the, the actual exploit is they would install a piece of software on that. This is all research, right? This is all research. They'd install a piece of software and then that device would then scan everything that it could see. So they really did get a entire scan of all IPs on the internet. So it's kind of an interesting thing, um, simply because people didn't change defaults. And when you see this all the time, people say, oh, this never happened to me. It happens all the time. Uh, you make sure you change the vendor defaults. Again, great thing. Server templates can do that. Um, the cloud actually help you do this because you don't just throw in a CD, right? You've had to, you can't just, this is really not altogether true. It's very hard to just throw in and get something default up in the cloud, right? There's got to be some thought. You've had to do some, some work to get there. So in that sense, it makes it a little bit easier. And it should give you a leg up since, you know, Changing defaults, configuring systems is part of something that you have to purposefully think about and do. So I think it's actually easier to hit this requirement and people in the cloud are less likely to be vulnerable to this one and fail. Uh, protect cardholder data. Uh, gets down to don't store what you don't need, uh, good crypto selection, and uh, you know, proper key management. I can't stress the proper key management. Uh, it's, it's probably the, the hardest thing to do. In, in the entire cloud environment, just period. Um, so having that, having that's important. Um, for block storage level, you can use something like Trend Micro Secure Cloud. I believe that like Google Compute Engine, that their ephemeral storage is encrypted by default. I gotta find out some more information to find out if that would actually suffice for a PCI requirement. But think about if it's on ephemeral storage, do you encrypt it in the database? Is that you know? Is it stored at rest? How do you do that? Um, you know, again, cloud's really not an issue here. It's the same issue if whether you're in a hosted environment or whether you own the device. It's not a cloud thing. It's about protecting that cardholder data. And I would argue that probably 50%. And this is not a right scale thing. This is from my history as a consultant. That probably 50% of the people that store cardholder data don't need it have no, no business doing it and would just make their life so much easier. Um, uh, secure the pan, uh, this is kind of a tangent on this. So how do you do? Let's say you do have to, you do have to store the pan. Most likely you're gonna store it 
I'm hoping you're stored in a database, right, and not in a, some flat file that everybody has access to, you know, don't store it in Dropbox. Or, I know people probably think, oh, nobody's stored in Dropbox. Ah, I'm telling you. Um, per requirement three, right, if you store cardholder data, then you must encrypt, right, so does your database support it? I think Oracle has a mechanism by where you can do that by, by default as part of the part of Oracle. I know there's a couple of, I was on a customer call the other day and they're using a partner that does uh, uh, column level encryption on MySQL. I don't remember what the partner was. I'll remember it and I'll tweet it or something like that. Um, what's that? Gazang. Gazang, yes. Gazang was the, was the one. So they do encryption of MySQL, a uh, great deal. You know, encrypted file system on block storage, you know, inject uh, keys at launch, you know, how do you do that? And then, uh, again, management of encryption keys. I feel like a broken record, but mostly I just want everybody to realize that that is the, that's the thing that you should probably spend most of your brain power on in, in developing these things. Uh, requirement for encrypt in transit, no difference between cloud or anything else. Really what we're talking about is TLS. Um, sometimes you can have some database. Again, this you have to you have to encrypt cardholder data as it trans as it uh, tra not transfers uh, transverses or flows over public networks. If you can consider it private, it does not need to be encrypted in transit per the PCI DSS. Doesn't mean you shouldn't, but it doesn't have to be. Uh, SSL. You know, TLS is, you know, the de facto way to do this. And I would argue that while this is a good kind of everybody, we talk about SSL, you know, I have a Xerox machine, which really means I have a copier, right? We say SSL, people should not be using SSL anymore. You should be using TLS and you should be using TLS version 1.2 or greater. If you do any type of looking at vulnerabilities in the kind of the SSL protocol suite, SSL v3, you might be able to get away with it a little bit, but go to TLS. They've done a lot of stuff uh, to, to improve it. I would, if you're designing this new, TLS 1.2 is the way to go. Uh, AV and malware, uh, key to this, you know, not cloud specific, but the key to this is on operating systems that you know, it's applicable to. That's part of the PCI DSS. You know, servers come and go more frequently, so if you have Windows boxes for the PCI DSS, you have to run AV on it. Part of your cloud management solution, we don't happen to run Windows systems, we're Linux, so I don't have this, but I'd use server templates to deploy that. Again, how do you know it's running? Because it gets deployed as part of the management mechanism that I use. Uh, again, nice aspect of cloud is this is all automated. So AV and malware, really has to deal with and where you should look at it mostly are the end systems, right? The systems that your developers, that people are interacting with the system, that's where you care about running AV and, and how it really applies in the cloud environment. Because since you can't get to the systems, people have to administer them at some level, right? If they're administering them, even SSH, SSH into them off of a Mac, you should be running AV on your Mac. Right? Because there's a possibility something could happen, a Trojan, steal keys or something else to be able to get into that, uh, that uh, the environment, the cardholder data environment. A requirement six, develop, um, development and system administration. These are, I kind of rolled them together. You know, but what, securing systems is not really a cloud thing, but you know, how do you do this? How do you roll that out? How do you make sure that your instance is fully patched before the services, before it's allowing listening services come in? You know, that's one of the, that's one of the questions I was actually talking to a couple of our, a couple of our uh, architects on how we can do that with, with right scale, with the images that we have, and whether you roll your own armies, how you end up doing that. How do you make sure those things are patched before you, before you basically attach them to the network and open them up to the wide world? Um, you need to deploy hardened systems, for us, again, right scale, chef, puppet, however you deploy systems is how you do that. You'd go through and you would make sure there's no defaults. You'd make sure that things are patched, that you don't have excess services running on them. This, everybody at this point should be kind of going, this is kind of boring. It's like, yeah, the reality is, is that most of this stuff is, it's 
It's just what we know what to do. It's a matter of making it happen. And in the cloud, the one problem ends up being is that we can deploy things so quickly that we can get sloppy. And if we get sloppy, that's where we end up getting bit. Um, requirement 7, 8, restrict, uh, basically restrict access and users. So this is really about are you doing, you, you have to have individual users. I have to be able to attribute, Luke, is that, so I'm going to pick on him since we're kind of, so, so I have to be able to attribute actions to Luke. I can't attribute it to root. Right? You can't log into your systems as root and, and have, that, have it happen. So from the user standpoint, we need to make sure that you have unique users IDs and you, be, you need to be able to ac access, do access restrictions, you know, what to do, how to do it. Role-based access control is nice. I mean, that's one of the nice things that RightScale gives you that eh, right now, Amazon through their IAM, you can actually do it, but through other cloud providers, it's not as simple. Um, so through RightScale, you can say, oh, I'm going to give Luke and these other people the ability to log into the server, but these other people, they can't. They can, maybe they can do security manager to do firewall rules. So you can, we provide that mechanism, but making sure that you have role-based access control on the systems that are part of the cardholder data environment is super important. Uh, I personally use a combination of right scale policies and regular audits. So, you know, how do you do it? One of the things, people can log into our systems, right? People do that. So what I do, right, we've got right scale policies, only these people have certain server login permissions. Policies is you have to do these certain things and not, we happen to use OSEC as a, if you want to call it an intrusion detection system, I've got it set up. I wrote a set of custom rules that tell me when different people log into things. Um, so that's kind of my, how do I implement this? How do I meet that requirement? Is I look at it, I know who's supposed to access reviews every quarter. I'll look at it and say, who's got server login? Hey, wait a minute, why is this guy? Oh, he became part of the ops team. I didn't know that. Okay, good. I saw that login. So and I've, I've caught a few things during you know, during the last few months, like, yeah, hey, I didn't, we had two new ops guys start. I didn't know about, you know, I'm not in the channel that says you have to know about it, right? It's, I'm just the director of security. I'm not like, oh, tell this guy everything. So I'm like looking and all of a sudden, I had two people log into systems that I had never seen before. And for me, that's like, and only a few things kind of make me, kind of get me riled up and that's one of them because um, it's, we're cloud, right? Somebody breaks into our systems. There's no firewall to shut down, right? There's no this. We can't take it away. So looking is important. Again, to me, a lot of this, again, gets back to there's really no difference between cloud or anything else. It's just a matter of having these things implemented. Mostly, if what you have to do is take from an on-prem or anything and put it into a cloud environment, um, it's those, you know, it's those salmon boxes that we kind of have to worry about. A lot, of it's, a lot of it's firewalls. Physical access, this is the great part. I love this part about cloud. Oh, my cloud provider. That's where my stuff sits. I, as long as they, I've got them covered, I'm good to go. Right? That's, that, that meets that requirement. I have the requirement to make sure they meet the requirement. Hey, Paul, how are you, man? Um, so that's it. Again, really no different than a hosted environment in this sense. This one's going to bite you, almost guaranteed, because nobody's doing it. I just, it's, this has been my experience. Logging and tracking, basically you need host-based tools. Right? How many of you can get the network logs from Amazon, or from Google, or from Azure, or from anybody else? If you're not doing private cloud or not hosted, you don't have access to that information, so you're going to have to instrument things on the host. We use OSEC to do that, and Cloud Passage. It's a combination of those two. A lack of transparency in some of your devices, again, the hypervisor logs, you need to think about that. And really what that means is do you have a mechanism, if you suspect something at your provider, at that hypervisor layer, do you know who to call? Do you have somebody to talk to that you could basically do some intrusion detection and forensics and that you've got somebody there? Um, I use RightScale to configure systems and send local logs, basically send it to our OSEC, the way it's all designed and, and alerting there. Um, use a third party, again, back to Cloud Passage is a big win here. Um, I'm, I'm investigating, there's a number of people out there, I think AlertLogic, 
I, I know they're one of our partners, Sumo Logic. There are a number of tools that are out there that you can use to you know, configure this. But you know, you've got to configure the systems to send the logs. If there's no data, you can't do it. And most people are like, oh, where's the syslog? It sits locally on the box. The instance goes down. What happened? You got the visibility's gone. So you need to send it remote. You need to think about a centralized logging solution. And then you have to look at it. <laughs> right? Lots of people send logs to lots of things and nobody ever looks until there's a until somebody calls you up and says, Hey Luke, um, do you realize you, is there a reason why your system's scanning us? Like, oh shoot, you know, you go look, it's like, yeah, that thing's only been hacked for a week and a half. Right? So having having the ability to kind of look and actually actively actively monitor those things is important. Requirement eleven, testing. Um, coordination with your cloud service provider is important. Otherwise they're gonna say, hey, why are you scanning and you get nasty letters? Um, internal testing becomes a bit tricky. How do you do internal? So PCI DSS requires both internal and external vulnerability scanning and penetration testing. How do you do internal penetration testing on a cloud environment? Well, in Amazon, what that means is you have to put a, a device on that private network and be able to test from there. Right? It, depending on, it would be the same thing. You have to be able to go over that internal network. So it's different. There's a, little, there's a couple of caveats that you have to do that. You know, I recommend use an automated tool. You should set something. That's what we have at RightScale. We have an automated tool that scans, that continually scans all of our, continually. Monthly scans, all, every instance that comes up is scanned at least once monthly. Right? And so, boom, it happens. We get reports. Right? Then what myself and my team do is we actually do testing. We do testing on, you know, on a monthly basis or when releases come out. So we also we do testing on a regular basis, but not what I would consider uh, continuous. And then we actually will bring somebody in, a third party, to come in and annually test you know, what we've got. And for us, we're a Ruby shop. We're Rails. Ruby on Rails shop, so I find a company that knows our technology to be able to test it. I don't need somebody, gen I don't need a great Java program, you know, company great with Java to try to break into a Rails app. It just doesn't work. They don't understand some of the ins and outs. Um, while you can use a web application firewall, PCI DSS allows you to use a web application firewall in lieu of testing. You have to do one of the two. I prefer testing. Um, Use both if you can. I think that the testing is just better. I think all of this stuff, the reason you do it is because you want to be secure, not to check off a box. So I think all of this stuff is, is fairly pragmatic. And you know, for these things, you ought to be t you ought to have this whole setup in your, you know, in your company anyway that'd be testing other parts, other things that you do that are not PCI related. And lastly, governance. This is where everybody fails. And uh, this is because everybody, lots of people are doing the right things. Very few people have actually taken the time to document what they're doing. Actually writing it down, getting it approved, reviewing it annually, making sure that whole process, it's like, really? Like, you know, I just, part, it's part of brushing and flossing. So policies need to exist, you know, with or without the cloud. Again, this isn't something cloud specific. Appropriate language is in the contracts. We talked about that way back that you need to make sure that the language in there about protecting and complying with the PCI DSS is important. And right, the biggest issue you know, I run into is that if you share cardholder data, the contract states that. It's hard, I'm not in contracts. I don't know everything. So I'm always kind of continually, I'm over, hey, are we sharing with somebody? What's happening? Does our contract state this? Reviewing contracts, that's exciting. Looking at a contract, that's, you know, one of my, one of the best part of my jobs is being able to read contracts to see if that's in it. So, and this is one of those things, if you don't, if you don't monitor it, it's not going to happen. So you got to look at that. And the other part, the, the biggest one, is having an incident response plan and knowing that it works. And that really gets back to having people you can contact at your providers to be able to, that can give you information you need. You don't want to get to a level one help desk person if, if everything's hit the fan. You want to be able to have a contact that you can call that's basically a technical peer that you can get into and get some questions answered. 
And so, in summary, selection of your partners matters. It's super important. Your biggest issue is your application design and you know, system deployments are key. And knowing, you know, knowing how the PCI DSS applies to you. It's, it's, it's just something you have to walk through. And for the last time, PCI compliance in the public cloud is achievable. So I have an action item I'd like all of you to do is you know, go home and investigate where you are in the context of PCI and public cloud compliance. Is it something that you should do? Maybe it's not. Maybe you, know, you say, I don't want to be in public cloud. I don't want to. But if it is, what you should have today is you should understand that there are some things that are going to take some effort. And a lot of things are just, it, you're probably already there. You're probably a great way on that path. So with that, any questions? Told you it was an exciting presentation. I can tell, you know. Yes. Oh, 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 oh. Sorry. It's being, it's being recorded. Hi. My name is Andrew Burke from Pearson. So my question is. Pearson, I like you guys. It's, it's <coughs> we have a lot of challenges with just data in general anyway, not necessarily PCI, but with school children. Um, so do RightScale have any templates where they have a lot of this baked in that we could use? So, yeah, I'm just going to repeat the question. So do use RightScale have templates, right, that people can use that will actually protect data, which, which, which somebody pointed out to me will use non-public information, NPI. So stuff that's, that's important but may not be regulated. And the answer to that is no. It, th there, there isn't, and mostly, because if you get back to, it, it really deals with partners and how you want to do that and whether it be uh, Gazang, are you using MySQL, do you want to use Gazang, or is it EBS, do you want to use Trend Micro Secure Cloud to secure it, or do you, so there's, there's a ton of, it's like choose your poison, that's probably a bad word, Right, bad, bad choice. But choose your great solution and then be able to implement that. Um, so, but the short answer to your question is no. I will say I've talked to, to Dan, um, Dan Moore, who's the new VP of services. And one of the things that's on my plate coming from a consulting background, and I did basically professional services for 15 years before I came here, um, is to, to provide some of that. What I would consider reference architectures. And if you want to come in, it's like, hey, it's, it's almost like this. It's like, this is how I do it, right? This is, this, I, I use Cloud Passage to do this. I do it this way. If I was using MySQL and we were storing, pan, I'd use Gazang to do the data encryption. And then you could say, I don't want to use that. And it'd be like, okay, but so the, the desire is in the fairly near future to have some of those things where it does make people, it's a little easier to, to move forward. Any other questions? I don't think there's cookies or anything, so I can't, you know, let, let you out early. All right. With, uh, hold on. I, I think I got something. I think, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Wrap up. You know, I've walked this path. Again, contact me if you, if, if you need any help. Um, Phil at rightscale.com. Um, Twitter, uh, security professional, Zek Prof. Um, this is my personal Twitter account, so, you know, it's, so you get, you get all of Phil with this Twitter account. So. Um, and on Google+, Plus, Phil at rightscale.com. Uh, LinkedIn, you know, anything like that. I, again, I'm more than happy to share. I'm probably transparent to a fault. I'll tell you everything that we do, the things I run into. But to me, it's not, none of it's secret. It's just about, we're all kind of walking the same path. Um, I happen to be, like I said, in a purely cloud play, which, which I've, there's nobody I know of that is in the same boat that I, that I am and has to deal with the same things, which is fun and challenging. So with that, we're done. Thanks. Thank you all for coming.